uh, what I'm going to start with this bit is um, uh, reflexivity and then currying. So as Colin would put it, this is the bit where I draw all the arrows um, and put lots and lots of stars on things uh, because that will give us the framework for understanding what's going on when we actually start applying edge joints to things. So, uh, so we're going to start with reflexivity. So uh, you will recall that we are dealing exclusively in Hilbert spaces. And so if B is a Hilbert space, um, then um, we already met um, V star, which is the space of bounded linear functionals from V to R, which for practical purposes is all of them. Is that actually better than the other was writing last week, or should I use yellow? I have a feeling that feels kind of uh, quite pale. I might, I might switch back to yellow. It might be more visible. Looks well well. pretty good here. Yeah, we can see it quite well. Oh, okay. Um, right, and I'll stick with the white. Uh, no, I'm not going to go yellow. Um, and um, so this thing, of course, um, is another Hilbert space. So um, it's the Hilbert space uh, with uh, the dual norm on it, which uh, if like me, you uh, think in concrete terms, uh, the way you get the dual norm is you take the Reese representers to get back into the primal space and then take the primal norm. And what does that effectively mean? So it means that if I have, uh, yeah, that's better. Um, if I have V star, U star, and this is the star norm, um, then uh, that's um, <coughs> equivalent to the primal norm of V and U where V is the Reese representative of um, V star and U is the Reese representative of U star. And if I uh, shift back into having a basis so that I can uh, remember what this means in an actual calculation and turn all these abstract inner products into matrices, um, then we remember that this is uh, the VTMU, but VT is, or V is equal to M inverse times V star, and U is equal to M inverse times U star. So this is equal to V star T M minus T M. Um, M minus one U star. And uh, now I can uh, cancel whatever I like because you'll remember that these are uh, inner products. So those M's are known to be symmetric positive definite. Mm -hmm. And so in particular, when I wrote M minus T here, I might as well have written M minus one. So I can cancel it whichever way I like. And so, that's equal to V star T M minus one U star. So the um, dual norm is simply given by the inverse of the matrix that gives me the primal. That is fine. Okay. So this guy is a Hilbert space. It's got this inner product. Uh, I'm not going to start attempting to prove that this is complete because the other one's complete. That's like way more analysis than we need to play with. What we are going to observe though, is if this play, if this guy is itself a Hilbert space, then it's got a dual, right? So I can now write B star star, and that's going to be the space of bounded linear functions from B star to R. 
and uh, we might be starting to get concerned here because how many stars am I going to add on and is this going to become misguided? Um, however, uh, the good news is that actually this is where we're going to stop. And uh, the reason um, for this is so let's um, think about what the um, risk representation theorem says for things um, in uh, this space. So suppose I have middle V star star in V star star. Then for all uh, so, so for all V and v, v star star, there exists a unique V star in V star such that for all U in uh, U star in V star. V star star um, applied to U star is equal to the inner product of V star with U star in the star in the dual in the dual, right? So this is the same thing that we've always learned. You can get from the dual space back to the primal space. It's just we now in the double dual space, so the primal space is the dual space. Um, and um, now we can um, uh, unpick this again, and I'm going to do this now in the sort of concrete way involving matrices, because I think that's the more accessible way to understand what's about to happen. Um, and so what I can do is, so this thing, assuming I know my basis, which I will always assume, is equal to V star um, T M inverse U star, which is equal to V T M M. Sorry, sorry, go. On. Yeah inverse u star, um, which is equal to that cancels v t u star, which is equal to u star applied to v, where v is a um, member, so v is now in v, <coughs> but it's got exactly the same coefficients in this basis as V star star must do. Because that's what I just did, right? And that's true independent of which basis I chose. I know nothing I did there um, made it. So if I change basis, I get a different matrix M, but I still get M and M inverse. So they still cancel. And so what that means is um, applying V star star to U star, applying something in the double dual space to something in the dual space is the same thing as applying that same thing from the dual space to something apparently indistinguishable back down here in the primal space. And so what that means is that for Hilbert spaces, and actually for somewhat larger classes of um, uh, spaces, but not all Barnard spaces, so uh, it's not true that all um, or it's not true that all Barnack spaces have this property, but it is true that all Hilbert spaces have this property, and we only care about Hilbert spaces, so win. 
V star star is to all intents and purposes V. Right? The technical term is there is a canonical isomorphism between V and, uh, and V star star. So that effectively means we can substitute V and V star star for each other whenever that is a convenient thing to do. Your, your proof is, is only works for finite dimensional physics. You just end with this. That's right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was I was being concrete. You can um, so you, if you keep applying the race representation theorem, uh, you can fill the board with algebra and get there um, in an infinite dimensional space. And I I have made the judgment call that that would be more confusing than what we're doing here. But you are, you are correct. I did assume the existence of a finite basis in order to to demonstrate what was going on. Um, other proofs are available. Okay, so that. Uh, something that we're just going to file reflexivity is something we're going to file and use in 10 or 15 minutes time we need another piece of ammunition as well before we start doing adjoint operators um and so the somebody just posted a message which i can't see it's not very interesting okay um so um the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at currying uh, not a culinary activity. Um, so, uh, not quite sure um, who else is. Uh, so, the thing through your uh, pub quiz list of uh, scientists for whom um, both their first name and their last name, uh, uh, they have something named after them. Uh, but it's true in this case. So, there is a prominent 20th century theoretical computer scientist slash mathematician, what's the difference between those two anyway, um, called Haskell Curry. So if you've heard of the Haskell programming language, uh, that is named after him. Uh, we're not concerned with Haskell right now. Uh, the other thing that's named after him, him is currying, which is something that you can do to functions, which we do care about. So we're going to look at curry. It's also the, also the curry Howard isomorphism. Thank you, yes. Um, so uh, let's assume um, we have um, uh, a function uh, which goes from uh, u cross v, and I'll put it on this side because I don't need linearity at this stage, uh, into W. So I could, so um, I could partially evaluate this function, okay? So I could choose, uh, You actually, I will make this linear. I don't need it to be linear for these purposes, but if I call this linear, then I can um, call what I'm about to do the action, which will make it easier for you to understand what's going on later. So I don't strictly need that requirement when we do anything. Choose U in U. Then I can define a new function, which I will call action of F on u and that's equal to f with u fixed and whatever i put in there and so this thing is now defined on a new space right so this thing uh, is a member of the space of functions that goes from uh, along V into W. It's a way of making a new function. So actually what that means if we go back up here is this is a perfectly good definition of uh, the function signature of F. It's a thing where if you gave me something in U and something in V, 
I give you back something in W, but a completely equivalent um, definition of this is that F is something which takes things in U and gives me back things <laughs> in the space of functions from V to W. Right, so this is a um, right associative operator, the arrow. So you have to understand the brackets is going here. Right, and so um, that's going to show up as something that is um, useful again and again and again in a <laughs> slight. Someone say something? In a slightly more specific. Um, guys than the one that I've just drawn. Um, and that is merely uh, to point out all the time that um, if I wrote, let me take this out here, let me choose this PR. So if I write F hat goes from U cross V R, then I might as well also have written F hat goes from U into East. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to think about that back, back with our friends, the matrices, uh, then uh that still works so if you um so you can think of um a make uh, this thing as being represented by a matrix where i right multiply by something from u and i left multiply by something from v and um that's equivalent to saying that i um this matrix is something where if I write multiplied by U, I'd be left with something which I could still left multiply with a V. Yeah, that's, that's all that that identity is saying. Um, and that switch between those two is the thing that left, right and center will um, enable us to build adjoint operators all over the place. So let's do adjoint operators. This is the, these are after all, the creatures that we're going to need to make this whole adjoint game work. So David, just a quick question. The hat yeah. means it's a matrix or what? I missed yeah, that. The hat just meant that it's a different function F from the F in the previous line. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sorry? Different but equivalent. No, it's not equivalent. The first one was into some arbitrary space W and the second one was into R. And not all Ws are R. Um, okay. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, now I see what you did with it. Yes. Um, so, um, so that example, by the way, so uh, if you recall, um, function, so multilinear functions that map into R we call forms. And so this gives you a uh, identity between any multilinear operator and a form, because I can always just take the dual of the last argument and turn it into a form. And that that's will come back again and again and again and again. Okay. So adjoint operators. So <laughs> suppose we have an operator A, which is a linear operator from U into V. Um, so remember another way of making um, this same argument about 
uh, the currying is to say um, another way of understanding this is um, all you in the U and for all uh, V star in dual space for V, V star applied to A applied to U gives me something back in R. Right, because I apply A to U, I get something in V, and V star is the space of things where I apply to things in B and I get something back in R, and both of those things happen linearly, so this was multilinear. Um, okay, so then, um, there exists a unique A star, where A maps <coughs> linearly from B star into U star. And um, A is defined by uh, this uh, equality, A star, B star applied to U is equal to um, B star A U right for all such stuff. But for then yeah for for all for all B star in B star all you do. Okay, so uh, essentially this operator composes the other way around from this operator. All this is saying. Um, the thing that, so uh, there are like a bunch, a bunch of these things like the differentiation thing. Um, um, earlier, it took me years and years and years to really get my brain around the distinction between an adjoint and an inverse, because they kind of look um, similar because they both go backwards. Um, and the thing that's different is, so we're talking about composition rather than undoing the operation. And that revealed itself in the fact that the adjoint maps between the dual spaces. So A star is the adjoint operator. A star is the adjoint operator. Whatever well, exists in A star, this thing when we find it is, is going to be the adjoint operator. Um, and so let's work out if we, um, uh, so let's using um, what we've previously written down, we can recover back by once again appealing to basis, which is I'm going to do all the time because um, it makes it easy to understand, we can like establish what this guy is and how it works. So, um, so what have we got? We've got A is a thing from U to V, um, which means equivalently, A is a thing from U to V star star. Okay, this is where all this currying is coming in, right? That's just an identity. Equivalently, A is a thing from U um, cross V star to R. Um, so now we can actually understand um and so if we write that um then uh what's a star well so a a star is a similarly equivalently a thing from b star 
across U R given by A star of V star U equals A U V star. Once again, for all U's and V's in the relevant spaces. Um, for those of you who are uh, used to thinking about adjoints in UFL, um, this is why, because remember, now I've just written this as a form. This is why when I have a form, taking the adjoint simply relabels the arguments, swaps the arguments. So um, when I have a form, we don't think about having to swap between primal and dual over here. And the reason why that's the case is because this signature is only equivalent to this, this signature. It's not actually the same. And if I keep going, I can observe that I can re-squish that um, U into R back into a U star. And so this is equivalently a thing which maps from V star into U star as originally predicted over here. And um, if I were to uh, expand um, this in our uh, bases, then it would become, I think, really obvious what's going on. Because this is a bilinear operator. It must be given by a matrix A. We're no longer talking about an inner product. So there's no pretension to that A is Square, <laughs> invertible, symmetric, positive. No, 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 that. It's just a matrix A uh, of the appropriate sizes to match my um, uh, thing. So I'm abusing notation slightly by writing A for the matrix and U and V for the coefficients, but that works. So this thing is um, simply um, V, T, a U. Okay. The fact that I wrote these that way round is because that's how we write linear algebra. This is this whole confusing numbering thing, right? The first thing we multiply by with is the thing on the right, so that consumes this thing and then the other one. Um, and so now we can work out what that must be equivalent to uh, on the other side. And that must be equivalent to um, that. Yeah. And so all that we're basically saying is that the adjoint is the linear operator, which generalizes the transpose. Um, if I was doing it in complex, I'd have to now have a, a bra versus ket argument about where the, con uh, the conjugation goes. And there are two answers and it's really confusing. Fortunately, we're gonna restrict ourselves to reals so that I don't have to have that conversation. The, um... Where you've written the thing you just wrote is that you transpose a transpose, transpose or a star a transpose. Well, so we're real, so a transpose and a star are the same thing. Yeah, because star is simply transpose conjugate, right? But have you purposefully written that as a transpose rather than? Yes, because at the beginning of last lecture, I specified that everything inside would be real exactly, so that I didn't have to talk about where all the conjugate applications go. Yeah. Okay. Um. David? Yeah. But the question, the, the matrix A includes also uh, isomorphisms for the V stars into its representative in. So, yeah. like... yes, because these things are the lists of yeah. <clears throat> um, 
Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So Rob, Rob, Rob Kirby has this nice notation where he defines IH to be the map from RN into the, the finite element space, and then A is an operator, and then the matrix A hat is just the pre and post multiplied yeah. by that. Yeah, you, you can do that. But I mean, the, <clears> this <throat> comes from the fact that A is defined to come from B star. Uh, uh, yeah. So that yeah, that's yep. Uh, that 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 goes. So the um. The matrix that you get A comes from um, expanding in the appropriate basis, and the appropriate basis for V star is a dual basis, which puts in what you are just asked for, right? If you expand in the dual basis, that's what you get. Okay, <clears throat> so now, uh, half an hour into this lecture, we can return to the last thing we wrote at the end of last lecture. Where we wrote down a problem that we might actually solve in an adjunct method. Right? So let's write down that problem again. So, um, Suppose we have J from uh, U cross M to R. And so we have uh, oh, and then we have U. Um, goes from U into M. So then we can write this guy down like this, which is just a, a composition of those two functions. Obviously, it's not a coincidence that I've chosen that particular notation because that's how we usually write down the functional in a PDE constraint optimization problem. Does um, little U go from M to U? Uh, yeah, it does, sorry. Yep, you're right. Had his copy. Yeah. It even goes from a new semicolon into no, M. Uh, M semi semicolon into U. And over here, uh, these guys also, the semicolon after them, there is no assumption here that anything here is linear. These are all just functions, right? Um, yeah. Everyone's now allowed to be nonlinear. Um, and so um, what we want to do is we want to compute J, D, J, D, M, purposefully big Ds here, because then we have to uh, hit ourselves with the chain rule in two variables, which is so that's my easy term because it's the one where the dependency on M is direct. Uh, and now I have to do my term where the um, operation is um, uh, indirect. And so what I get is now, well, I can now write this, it's actually an action of partial J partial u evaluated at um, u of m m uh, it would help if I remember the definition of a gas yeah, so driven in here gave myself an m hat in direction uh, I know it's very culinary. Um, yeah. M, uh, U of M 
M N hat. Right. And so uh, if I now neglect these parameterizing terms, I'm going to turn up everywhere. So they're, they're all the same. We can look at the new N. U, yeah, U only eats N, so the DUDM term doesn't have a UM in its bracket. It's just, it's just DUDM of M colon N. I don't think that's right because um it's still oh i see sorry yes yeah, yeah you're right yeah um so and re you'll recall so this guy goes from um semicolon so start with the semicolon but importantly from m to r so that thing is, if you assembled it, it's a M vector or an M co-vector. It's, it's an M star. And um, this thing down here is a U to R. So it's a U star. That's OK. And this thing down here is in MTU, <laughs> semicolon parameterizations come before that, uh, which is potentially very inconvenient because that guy's a scalar space, so this thing is a covector. That thing's a scalar space, so this thing's a covector. That thing is a. Um, uh, effectively a I mean this equivalent to an M plus U star R. So this thing is an M by U matrix and I didn't make you any promises about sparsity, for example. And in fact if you um think about so we've deliberate deliberately been ducking the uh question of PDEs, but we'll get to them very, very soon. Um, but if you think about that, then this operator here isn't your discretized PDE operator, which is nice and sparse. It's the result of solving the PDE. So in effect, it's the inverse of that operator, which is definitely not sparse. So making this guy could ruin your whole day. And the whole point of the adjoint approach is to avoid making this guy. Um, and so um, what we've got here is um, exactly the circumstance that we um, <clears throat> viewed earlier, right? So we have, here is my operator um, A, which goes from M to U, and um, here is my uh, operator, and here is my B star, which is in U star, and what I'm missing is the thing on the right-hand side, right? So if I only wanted the action of this guy on a particular M, then life would be fine, right? So if I substituted a particular M into here, I'd get a particular thing in U here, and then I effectively have a covector which I could assemble here, and I just take the dot product between those two sets of coefficients and I will be done. That's the tangent linear model, right? So the tangent linear model is I choose one particular direction to take my partial derivative in, I substitute that in and I can do one calculation and I get one answer out. The magic here is instead I don't choose M and I instead um, 
find A star and I say, and I apply, so um, let's, I simply write here, lambda star if you like. So I just define this thing to be equal to lambda star. And so I can write lambda star equals, lambda star is going to be the thing that's going to pair with m hat to make this number. So the, so you're, you're, that's right. Your brace ends just before the m hat. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that, that is exactly the right point for it to land, right? Um, or if you prefer, we can call this lambda star of m hat. Do you want to substitute in that way? So this is um, right. That's just me rewriting the same thing using the definition of A. And now I am just going to take the adjoint of both sides of this equation. You see an impact now. Uh, a has got A contains the M hat, right? A is the UDM M M hat. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so all I can do is I can say lambda of M is equal to action of A adjoint on. Right. And this works because remember, this thing is a dual object and adjoints each dual object and give me back the dual object over here, which is what I was expecting. Right? I'm expecting this to return something in N2R. So we're, we're happy. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna like uh, jump to the chase and kind of do the last stage of what we would be sort of classical adjoint uh, description. And we're going to say, ah, what if this thing is in fact the solution to a P group? So what would that operator, how do, how do we get that operator A out? if there really is a PDE in it. So now what we're saying is U of M is defined implicitly by the statement uh, F of U of M and M Right, so that's residual form of a partial differential uh, differential equation. Um, and so um, what I remember what I need is um, the UDM in order to substitute back into my original equation. And um, so how am I going to get that? <laughs> Well, I'm going to get that by making an observation that U by definition solves this equation. What that means is Sorry, can I just understand your notation. So, is, so the, the so by this you mean so this is like a one form, and then you put up so it's a yeah, but it's a, it's a test function which you haven't drawn. But it's just because this is a one uh, form. I so. haven't made any assumptions that we're doing to wrong form, right? Oh, sorry, the winning reform. Okay. We don't need to be doing final element method for this bit to be true, right? Um, we, can, we haven't really just sort of talked about that, that that bit of the implementation. So then F, F maps to uh, some uh, the same space. That, uh, uh, F, F, so this is a residual, so F does have to map into the same, the same space. <clears throat> so F maps from um, a U and M to U cross M into U, or at least something which is 
suitably compatible with you, with model boundary conditions, mumble, all that sort of rubbish going on. Um, right. So um, what we uh, and now, so what we observe is this is true for all n, and this is solved for all n. So when I move m around, presumably m is actually a control on the solution. So u is going to move around, and u is going to move around exactly so that this expression is still satisfied. So what that means is that moving m around might well change u, but it definitely doesn't change f. Right, so this equation being solved for all m is equivalent to saying Under some tedious regularity assumptions, right? Assuming my PD is well enough by yeah. behaving <clears> and so on, um, but we're we're not concerned here directly with the analysis of PDEs, right? If the if the PDE works um, uh, nicely enough, then this will this will hold. Um, so now I can expand this left hand side uh, using the um, chain rule, the multivariable chain rule again, exactly the same thing that we did last time. So we get um, the F, the M at U, M, M, M hat, plus the F of action the F you um you m m um this right comma m semicolon m hat You don't need the M hat actually because you're doing action. Uh, well, the way I've written action, uh, you do because it's the action of this thing which still has a loose variable onto something. Okay. Yeah. If I otherwise I'd have to substitute GCD. Mm -hmm. um, the yeah. F, the uh, the UDM evaluated at M in the direction. Oh, this is in the direction you have. Oh. M hat. Right. Okay. Now we're now we're there. So that's the thing we're after. Right. We want the UDM. Um. And that's the thing. Um. So this thing is the Jacobian. This is the linearization of my. PDE operator, right? This is the thing I would solve at the first Newton step. Um, and this thing I can presumably calculate because um, it's the direct dependence of F on M. So this is just where M appears directly in the residual. So that's something mm -hmm. you can actually calculate. And once again, uh, this thing is sensibly sized. Um, this thing is sensibly sized. This thing right now is um, uh, the um, th this thing right now is um, the um, uh, it is a sparse matrix, but I want this going out, so I'm about to break that for us. Any very unresolved, you need to write equals zero. <laughs> I have one on your own. Um, right. Um, so, right. Well, of course, I do need to write equals zero, but what I'm actually going to do 
Is that going to write? That will also be fine. Yep. Uh, and in fact, um, and so now I can just invert this guy onto the other side. And so this is equal. So the Q M at this point is equal to minus uh, the F the U U and M M U hat. <clears throat> uh, applied to the F the M U M M M hat. Right now, action, action, if you like. Is yes, I shouldn't get implicit about my actions halfway down the expression. Right. So remember, F is uh, already U big. Right. It maps into into U hat. So this thing is a U by M bilinear operator, and. Uh, this thing is now the inverse of a sparse matrix, which is in principle dense. And so what we've recovered is exactly the circumstance we were concerned about earlier, which is that DUDM is a massive dense operator that we don't want to touch. And so this is the tangent linear model again, right? It's just now this is the uh, PDE version of the tangent linear model. If I chose an M hat, I could evaluate this guy. I could solve one linear PDE onto it. I'd have the partial derivative of, of um, I'd have this partial derivative in one particular direction. What I'm actually going to do, but not today because we are um, out of time, is I'm going to take this, substitute it back into my previous uh, expression, and use this adjoint trick again. So I'm not going to invert the FDU rightwards onto here. I'm going to invert the FDU leftwards onto the thing that came before it, which is equivalent to inverting the adjoint of the FDU. And that gives me a mechanism for getting around ever having to build this big thing, because the thing that's going to come in from this side will be something sitting in U star. It will just be a vector. I'll only have to invert a covector. I'll just have to invert this onto one covector. Um, incidentally, uh, if people will have dim recollections from first or second year analysis of the implicit function theorem, that was the implicit function theorem, right? So the implicit function theorem simply says that if I have an implicitly given function, then its gradient is given by the inverse of the uh, derivative of the, uh, of the residual. So, and at that joyous moment, I think uh, we will leave this.